Welcome to our latest webinar, Software Economics and Slippery Slopes for Product Companies. Today, I'm very pleased to say we're joined from California by software product management guru, Rich Murnoff, who will be leading this webinar today. Hi, great to join. So now let me pass over to Rich. Rich, over to you. Great, thanks very much. And uh, I grabbed a picture here of somebody who turns out not to be a famous American, as if you guest, but this is uh, Adam Smith, the famous British economist, because we're going to be talking about some numbers here and, and translating software products into money, into economics, into success. So, uh, you know, and then the back half of that, of course, since I'm an enterprise software guy, um, we're going to talk about one of the syndromes that I see in almost every enterprise software company, which is the slippery slope of trying to do one more thing for one more deal. Great, thanks, and, and uh, appreciate everybody joining. Okay, so here's our agenda. Um, we're gonna first talk about making money in the software business, and there's really two different approaches. There's the product approach and the services approach. I'm gonna try to differentiate those as crisply and carefully as I can. And then uh, a little bit about the, the specials dance. Yes, we know that we have a standard product, but this one big deal needs this one special thing. And how do we deal with that in companies where the sales pipeline is lumpy and the big deals are really big versus everybody else? Um, worth backing up for a second just to let you know why I have this point of view and, and how I come at it. I'm a almost 35-year veteran of Silicon Valley and U.S. West Coast software product management. So, by the way, this is not a new thing. And what I do these days, I coach heads of product. I sometimes design product organizations or do organizational assessments of product teams. And very occasionally, I parachute into a company as what we call a smoke jumper. That's an interim or temporary head of product when there isn't somebody already in that job. So I've been doing the product leadership work for oh, almost 20 years now in various configurations. So, so trying to channel that experience. OK, so there's our agenda. Let's jump in. Um, the, the first thing, and, and this is sort of the axiom that I'm going to build our little bit of economics on, um, in the software product business, and again, I'm going to make several attempts to differentiate between software product companies and software services companies, it's all about the volume. So if we're going to make money on software products, it's not the first copy of it that is where we expect the profits. It's the nth copy. Now, whether we're measuring seats or subscribers or downloads or whatever your unit of value is, the, the point of a software product company is that we can add that nth user, copy, seat, subscriber, download, whatever it is, at nearly no cost. And that's why we end up making money, because we built it once. We've sold those bits, those services many times. And it's also why, key fact here, um, when you're running a software company and you're in the merger and acquisition game or you're going public, what we see over and over again is that software product companies tend to be worth 6x or even more. Lately, it's a much higher number uh, of revenue. So a $10 million run rate software product company might sell, might go public for 60 to $100 million. Whereas if you're a services company, pretty much you're getting about one times revenue uh, from the acquisition or the, the public offering. Really important because when we set our goals for how we're going to exit or how we're going to turn this into money for ourselves, uh, key issue. Uh, anybody old enough to remember that colorized version of uh, Lucy from the 1950s? There's the assembly line. Okay, rolling ahead. Um, and, and pinning some numbers underneath those, and I've changed these into pounds and I've had little estimates here because it'll turn out that the numbers don't have to be exact, just order of magnitude, give me to the first digit. But if you go price what your development team costs you or your company, um, here might be six to eight people who are developers, designers, DevOps, tech ops, technical writers, uh, test engineers, whatever they are. Roughly speaking, your team of six to eight costs your company about a million pounds a year plus or minus, the difference doesn't matter, because it's really a fixed cost, 
whether that team delivers anything useful or not isn't a question of how much we pay them. Um, more important though, if you look at any mid-sized to large software company, what you'll discover is they spend most of their money not on development. The vast majority of the money they spend is on marketing and sales and travel and legal and real estate and benefits and all the other things. In fact, at a typical uh, medium to large software company, they spend about one out of every six pounds or dollars or yen or euros on the development process and building new stuff. What that means for us here, most importantly, is if we spend a million dollars on our next development team, the corporation's got to bring in something on the order of six million dollars, or here six million pounds, to offset to make that a break-even proposition, because we're going to spend five of those six on everything else. And so back to fundamentals here, if I'm in the software business, I probably want to make sure I, I have as a goal that I'm going to spend very, very little additional money bringing on my next user, my next transaction, my next seat, my next whatever. Uh, here, my guess is about 3%. So if we're spending 20% of revenue bringing on the next customer, then we're going to fail as a product company. Uh, in the hardware business, it's certainly less than 20%. And that's important just for the takeaway here, right? Because our goal in the software product business isn't to minimize costs. This is going to be very different from some other settings that you are in. The goal is to actually maximize revenue. So I'm willing to spend some of those beautiful Bank of England notes you see right there to get the best team, to get the smartest developers, to get the most artistic and insightful UX, UI designers, to get great test automation engineers, because I'm not actually trying to spend less. I'm trying to build better. Because when we build better, we can add lots of more customers at, say, 97% margin. Because remember, all the money is not in the first copy, in the first seat. It's in the nth seat. So as we scale up, what we find is better products actually win in the market. And the cost of the development team's not important once we cross break even. Again, we're going to be deep in the numbers for a bit here, but uh, still stick with me. Okay, so... Um, what does that tell us? The first thing we notice is that most successful software companies, not just consumer ones, but B2B ones, have put together some kinds of tiers or bundles where it becomes easy to sell the same version or package or tier or bundle many, many times without lots of variation. So this is a chart that I'm hoping every one of you has seen on dozens or hundreds of software sites where you know, it's a SaaS thing. You can download it. You can give them their credit card or you can, you know, sign yourself up for the service. And you have really three clear choices here. You want the basic expanded or advanced. There's not a choice to take the Chinese menu approach where we include or disinclude each of 20 or 30 or 60 or 100 features. Uh, those of you who are at companies that have that Chinese menu model uh, immediately, I think, know that it's really hard to configure a product. And if you, if your sales team and your customer has to make 90 choices, yes or no, on each package, on each item, on each feature, uh, they're very afraid of getting it wrong. They usually get it wrong, and it wastes a lot of time. So again, if we're going to be in the volume software business, we really want to have a small number of packages or tiers or bundles. And critical, you see the little circle here, the critical thing is to have done some segmentation and analysis and customer validation work such that we know which features, and there'll only be a few, might be the ones that cause basic customers to trade up to the expanded product and give us more money, right? So we're going to segregate our features into a few different columns here so that they meet different needs, they hit core personas, however you want to describe that, and that we should be very, very, very clear on which of our customers should be excited to pay extra money to go from the basic to expanded to the advanced. Um, as an example here, um, I almost always see that business to business products that pitch both to small businesses and large businesses have a bunch of features that only the large businesses want. And they have to do with single sign-on and delegated authority and geographic failover. And there's a whole bunch of things that big companies want that small companies don't. And so if we can segregate the big company features into the big company version, 
then we can charge less money to the small companies that don't need those things and have a very clear upsell excuse for why the big companies are going to pay us more money. So again, this is about thinking through the, the speed, the velocity of selling and taking out of the hands of our sales force some infinitely complicated set of things that they can't get right and confuse the customers. So again, simplify, 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 get back to volume. Um, another way to look at this is, um, and we're gonna talk some more here about services versus product, um, and let me define that here. For me, a technology services company is one that takes on projects, not products, but projects for individual customers, and for the most part, builds what that one customer needs, ideally with some profit margin. They turn that over to the customer and then they move to the next project. Definitionally, they don't own that IP, they can't resell it. They may get some expertise out of it, but the fundamental goal of a technology services company is to keep their folks busy and to upcharge on the work they do, right? So what you see here um, is, um, Actually, we have this backwards, so I'm going to apologize. I, I misbuilt this. We're going to go one more. And what I'll show you is uh, the custom development line or the services line there, the light blue one to the right. Notice what we get here is that custom development is effectively built by time and energy and effort. So if it's a 100-day project, we as custom developers are going to have to mark up the time and energy of our very smart developers, and we're going to build based on inputs. By the way, if the customer asks us to build something that's not that useful, or they don't want, or they gave us the wrong specs, usually we get paid anyway. So in the custom development business, we get paid for effort. Uh, what we see on the other line, notice that the green line for software and hardware products, first of all, it starts negative. And that's important because if you're building software products, you don't actually get to collect money until you finish them and they're good and people buy them. And so we're always going to start a deficit because it might take us a whole year or more to build out that software product, and then we start to collect money. But notice that the slope of the line is not denominated in hours or people or days or time. It's denominated in the value units of our products. Downloads, seats, transactions, tax filings, uh, airline trips booked, whatever we're selling, the slope there is about getting more volume on our software or our platform, not how hard we worked. Actually, nobody cares how hard we worked. So in the custom development business, in the services business, again, we're paid for effort. In the product business, we're paid for value. If the customers don't like the product, they don't care how hard we worked. If they do love the product, they're gonna give us money. And once we cross over that break-even line, what we see is that software product companies make a lot more money than software services companies if they can pass break even. Again, basic economics, basic math here, but it's easy to forget when we have hundreds of customers demanding thousands of enhancements or ideas for new markets or whatever. Um, we as product folks have to be thinking about volume, 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 volume of the same bits, of the same platform, of the same SaaS transactions, right? Good, all right, so I've set this up. Let's, um, let's keep going, all right? So um, this is important because when I drop into a company as I, I've done maybe 150 times in the last two decades as an independent consultant, um, I'm trying to figure out if they're a custom development or services shop or they're a product shop. And here's some hints. So let's go down the chart, right? If you're in customer development, the way you measure success is whether you're keeping your folks busy. Usually there's some magic number like 85%. We wanna keep our, our technical staff about 85% busy because there's always a little headroom we need. Less than that, we're not making enough money. So at every staff meeting, every week at the executive table, we talk about utilization. Uh, the business model, we mark up our time. Uh, and so we're always chasing other folks who might be less expensive to show that we're better. Uh, this is a tough thing. We track, see projects and programs, you don't see products yet, right? When it's over, we give it to the customer, we might renew or we move on. 
uh, but there's no stability. There's no long-term teams that stay on the same product over a long period of time unless the customer renews. So we're really a project shop. Most important skill, of course, business development, get folks in the door. And we're graded no first, not on innovation, not on you know something very cool. What we're graded on is did we do the thing the customer asked us to do on time, on budget, on spec? Did we give them what they asked for? If it's of no value, it's kind of on them, right? And then most important here, almost every services business I've met or worked with really wants to build out some repeatable products or some platforms, but they rarely get there. And they rarely get there because when the next piece of work comes in the door, they pull the folks off who are working on that repeatable product or platform, and they put them on the next thing that's going to make money this quarter. Right? So when a customer wants something crazy or special or different, what we respond, of course, is great. If it's a new, if it's a new account, we get them a you know, statement of work. If it's a current account and they want to change their mind, we're going to collect extra money for that. We call that a change order. Right? Again, straightforward. When I sit in the executive meetings of custom development or services companies, this is what I hear. This is what I see. And of course, I'm going to contrast that dramatically with product companies here. So, and I'm going to use the word repeatable. Sometimes we talk about flywheel, right? Low friction. But if you're in a repeatable software product business, you don't actually care about staff utilization. You care about users or subscribers, whatever your unit of value is here, right? And the business model is explicitly not charging for our time. It's about how many times we can sell the same bits or platform or software or cloud activity, right? To many, many, many more customers so we can cross break even. Um, and we always track products and releases because we're gonna get that out to lots of folks, right? And the key skill here is segmentation validation because we have to decide before we collect the money that there's enough customers out there for this to be a highly profitable venture key activity for product managers segment the market figure out who wants it go out and validate it before we spend that million pounds building it is it a good idea because we're not graded on time on spec on budget we're graded on crushing the competition and winning lots of customers right so therefore at the very bottom you know uh many of you most of you if you're on the enterprise side you've said this phrase or something like it many times Big customer X wants you to add a new feature. Uh, the one I usually reach for is teleportation, right? How hard could it be? It's probably only 10 lines of code. We need it. You know, big bank, right? Um, you know, Barclays Bank wants teleportation. We said yes and put it on the purchase order. But the product answer is no. No, 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 no. Let me put that deep in the backlog where it will never come up because first, we can't build it. Second of all, it's really of not of general use. So what you see here and what I've seen over and over again is that product companies and services companies actually operate in an opposing model. I see it really, really hard to be half and half, to trade off, to do a little of both, because what you see is that the executive team actually frustrates itself. It rips itself apart because they're pursuing opposing goals. All right, let's keep going. All right, so um, let's talk about the slippery slope because that's the back half of this talk. Um, this is a pie chart I use a lot. By the way, pie charts have a great feature for executives, unlike all other kinds of charts, which is if you want to make one slice of the pie bigger, you have to make another slice of the pie smaller. This would seem obvious, but it's not. And most executive teams want us to do more of everything. So I always present this as a way to think about trade-offs. And in this sort of generic um, pie here, you see I've assigned about half of our story points or engineer weeks, whatever we're measuring, to visible stuff that our customers ask for all the time that they'll be able to see and love and give us money for or keep us from losing deals. So that's all the outward stuff. But the other slices are important, right? The red slice. We have to do a lot of investing to stay in the software business. Scalability, security, availability, fill in whatever abilities you like. We never want a customer to call us up and scold us for 
running out of capacity or being insecure. We've got to do that work to stay in business. And so we have to do it all the time to catch up. Likewise, all the infrastructure around test automation and fixing bugs and DevOps, et cetera, et cetera, right? We have to do that to stay in business. We can't sacrifice all that because just this quarter we have lots of features to ship. And then the most important and really the easiest to lose slice at the top where product management really adds so much value is before we start building and spending our million pounds a year on this team, let's make sure it's the right thing. Have we validated? Have we done design work? Have we rolled out mock-ups? Have we tried every possible way to confirm that there's really a market for this? Before, before, before we spend our million pounds a year on the team because that's unrecoverable. So that's our pie. We're going to use this a few more times uh, because we're going to knock holes in this theory. We're going to pretend to be enterprise salespeople. Okay, so let me put my enterprise hat on uh, and talk about the enterprise specials dance. And a special here is any one thing that one customer wants that's not at the top of our list and probably not of use to most other customers. That's the dance. Okay, so um, something to remember, and, and this I think is something that's different between enterprise companies and uh, consumer companies, because in a consumer company, let's imagine we're making Fitbits or um, basic spreadsheets or something else, right? Um, dating applications. Uh, we might have a million users but none of those users is actually individually big enough that their threat to abandon my product or quit or not renew matters so much, right? Um, in the consumer space, we're looking to sell 10 million copies at, I don't know, six pounds a year, right? But in the enterprise space, we're actually looking to close 20 deals this quarter at 700,000 pounds a piece, right? So in the enterprise space, we know that deals are lumpy that there's few of them. And I know that my CEO is watching every one of those deals. In fact, knows the name of every deal, knows the expected revenue, the sales team and all the issues, right? So this is gonna be important because every enterprise customer actually wants something special. And we all know this, we've heard this. Um, every time I sit down with an enterprise customer, they have a list of 20 or 90 or 640 things that we don't do that they really want us to add right? Infrastructure and ISO 9000 certificates and integrations with unknown financial packages and on and on. So for us in the enterprise business, when I show them the roadmap, in fact, it's not the last word, it's the starting point because those customers are going to look at my roadmap, love everything I'm doing, and then come in with the next set of teams. And importantly for enterprise sales teams, they may only have two deals they're going to close this quarter. Uh, so pretty important that they push, 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 push for whatever it is that that customer wants because they never want to lose their jobs over the fact that there was one more requirement or enhancement we didn't get, right? Really important. And the psychology of it's important because sometimes we think of salespeople, enterprise salespeople, in an unflattering way. We don't like the way they behave, but in fact, they're behaving exactly the way we're paying them, exactly the way we're rewarding them. Uh, they're doing the job they're supposed to do. So I love enterprise salespeople and I have, you know, no frustration or regrets that they make twice what I make usually, um, but I have to understand this, their psychology. So let's put up a little picture here. Uh, anybody who goes back to the 90s for famous movies, this is Alec Baldwin when he was young and gorgeous in Glen Gary, Glen Ross where we learn things like ABC, always be closing. Um, uh, Coffee is for closers comes from this movie. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece of work. You should all watch it. Uh, what's relevant here though, is that we, when we hire and measure and, and uh, reward our enterprise sales teams, we're looking for folks who are persistent, who are persuasive. They're always optimists because this quarter is gonna be better than last. And they may only have a few accounts they're focusing on, right? And the other thing that's key here, and, and I've described this in an outward way, we'll turn inward in a moment, but a key skill of enterprise salespeople is to figure out who on the customer side is our, our supporter and who's not our supporter. And if one of the key buyers is somebody not excited about us, but a different vendor, uh, we escalate. We find someone higher up in the organization 
who might go our way and tilt the deal in our direction. And, and this is only important because they're going to apply all these same skills back to the product management team. So when I, as a product manager, sit with the sales rep for some really big account and I say, no, we're not doing that. No way. Never going to happen. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. And think somehow that that's convinced my enterprise salesperson to walk away and not get paid today right? They're going to apply all these same skills because they're persuasive and they're persistent. And most importantly, they know how to escalate. And when they escalate, they're going to go over my head, right? So uh, usually first up the sales chain. So to the VP of sales and to the CEO. And if we remember, the CEO knows the names of every big account this quarter, right? So in effect, what I've concluded here is that enterprise sales teams are paid to subvert the product plan and to break the roadmap. That's their job. And so it's our job to hold the line and reduce the chaos and still ship something that lots and lots of customers want. Ah, uh, you may have seen some of these words, but I wanted to capture them here, right? Internal salesmanship. You're going to hear some of these every time an enterprise salesperson needs a feature that we've turned down, right? If product just understood how important this deal is, right? Um, how hard could it be? It's only 10 lines of code. You can pick it up from here, right? But I would say you're not a B2B enterprise product manager if you haven't heard those words in the last two weeks, right? So know that you're not the only one and know that the sales team is actually doing the thing we're paying them to do, even though it frustrates us. Okay, so let's come back to our pie chart. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about this and then we'll wrap up. So here is our pie chart before. This is the before picture. This is before the next sales escalation, right? And so we're going to tell this as, a, as a, an emerging story because when that very first escalation or demand comes in from the big enterprise deal early in the quarter, here's what we tell ourselves. This is the lie that we tell ourselves. We're going to put this one little thing into the plan for the quarter. It's not that big. We'll be able to knock it out. We don't have to take anything off the roadmap. Um, generally, uh, we have this funny discussion about words, and the sales team wants to use the word and in the phrase, yes, let's do everything on the roadmap, and I need this one little thing for this one huge deal. And of course, on the product management and engineering side, we know the world is about exclusive or, which means if we're going to do this one new thing, we're going to have to not do something else. And by the way, that's a tremendously frustrating answer to the go-to-market side of the house because they don't really believe it. They think that, you know, for the most part, we on the product side and our development side, there's lots of slack. We're eating bonbons. We're going to escape rooms when COVID isn't happening. Uh, we've got time on our hands, and that's just not the case. So as we play out this little pie chart, what happens is... First of all, we close this deal, we sign this deal, and we agree to do that one thing. Notice I put the validation slice off to the side. The very first thing we give up on the product and the um, design side usually is any kind of validation because this is an urgent, hot item. We drop everything and we don't want to decommit on things on our roadmap. So in fact, we give up the most important way that product management delivers value, which is just for this one week or this one month, we're going to postpone all our validation. Uh, by the way, I don't know if it's it's true um, in the UK or in Europe as it is in the US, but every January and February in the US, everybody who overate uh, on the holidays and put too many too many extra pounds on or kilos, depending on where you are, joins a gym. And one of the important facts is there's no health benefits to joining a gym. You actually have to go, you have to work out, and you have to go two or three times a week and sweat. Um, that's important here because we tell ourselves a lie that says just this one time we're going to make room for just this one deal and po push back all our validation, but we'll catch up next month. Hint, doesn't happen. Because the next thing is that sales rep who closed this deal and just got a big check or is going to at the end of the quarter takes the rest of the sales team out for drinks again, when that's possible based on COVID, and shares how he or she successfully escalated through to the CEO to get this thing approved. So within moments, every other deal starts to look the same. 
and we start to move into a sales driven roadmap that looks like this. And notice now we're stealing, we gave away validation, but now we're stealing from DevOps and test automation. We're stealing from our abilities. We're stealing from our roadmap. And over time, this pie gets pretty green, which means we've fallen into the services model. That's why I set that up at the beginning, because if we're doing things for one customer, uh, we, we lack the scale, we lack the scope, we lack the leverage. Um, and suddenly our company's not worth 6x revenue, it's worth 1x revenue. Um, get some of the finance folks not so happy. All right, so what do we do? What do we do with this problem? Um, I have two, two quick sets of solutions here. Um, uh, the, by the way, they're, they're both written at great length on my blog. If you haven't been there, you can find them. Uh, one thing I've done at a bunch of companies is we've set up the magic bullet theory, which means I give to the head of sales some little token. And again, I'm thinking in office because a physical token is better. And I let the head of sales know that we'll set aside one engineering week, anything they want. But it also means that every sales rep who comes to me can be sent back to the C to the VP of sales because that's who actually knows which deals matter. Um, and we want a little physical token because usually the VP of sales uses that, that magic bullet early in the quarter and within a week has forgotten. So if I can collect the little plush toy or whatever it is or, or shell casing, we can remember that the VP of sales gave it away too early in the quarter. And we've actually lined up our incentives here because the VP of sales or your chief revenue officer is paid on total revenue for the company. So we'll have in fact the right incentives to push down on a lot of these requests that don't close deals or aren't important or don't lead to volume sales. So here we've, we've co-opted the head of sales to help us make good decisions. Um, the other thing I use a lot, and here's a, it's a bit of a complicated picture, so I'll give us a quick walkthrough. Uh, the link at the bottom takes you to a long post that explains this, but um, I try to keep handy at all times and have my product managers keep handy at all times, a little bit of very lightweight, you could call it a roadmap, you could call it a Kanban chart, whatever, that shows what we're working on right now. Because I know that every one of my enterprise sales teams has forgotten in the heat of battle what it is that we're actually working on right now, and maybe they don't care, but it gives us the chance to ask better questions. Instead of yes or no, the better questions are the exclusive or questions. So up in the top right, let's imagine that my enterprise uh, end user app team is busy, they're doing a bunch of things, and somebody comes to me and a big customer needs a new app. Instead of saying yes or no, I get to ask the better question of, well, is that more important than the number one thing we're doing? We're underway on faster notifications that's going to have a lot of upsell on thousands of customers. Is it more important than the templates we're building? Is it more important than the auto update we're doing? The, the content doesn't matter here. But notice now we're comparing the new request to what's in the roadmap. And it also gives us a chance if we want. Sometimes we just use the last column. But I like to use this as a sort of um, process model. Because before we develop it, we should probably make sure that, that it's designed and defined. And before we design and define it, we should probably do our validation. So new things are going to appear in the left-hand column, not the right-hand column. And that's going to be a dramatic improvement in productivity for our team because it's fewer interrupts. Again, just a, you know, just a tool. There's lots of tools. There's no perfect tool. Um, but I'm trying to emphasize that we want to understand the behavior of the rest of the company. And then we want to map tools and strategies to addressing the behaviors instead of the individuals in ways that keep us on strategy and making money in the software business. Okay, take a deep breath. I think I've got some takeaways here. Um, for those who don't know, uh, at least in the, the Americas, that's a takeaway container for food. So there we go. Uh, four points, you can read them here. Um, if we're a product company, emphasis on product. We make money by selling the same bits lots of times, hundreds, thousands, millions, depends on your company. If we're a services company, we make money by charging for our time and our effort. And I believe that's a fundamental disconnect. Uh, I've seen very, very few companies that can do both of these successful, right? And if we're an enterprise company, we're always, always, always on the product side going to struggle with some request that looks like this. 
right? Just this one time, it's never going to happen again, right? It's a small thing, even though it's not. And how do we understand that in the aggregate, in the, in the behavioral sense, so we don't give our roadmap away every single day on every single deal? Because as product managers, it's our market focus. It's our focus on volume and large numbers of customers that really is balancing or offsetting the enterprise sales focus on individual accounts. Okay, I'm going to take a breath. Um, I think I have a, uh, do I have a contact slide here? That's me and one of my animals. That's my office manager, Celeste. Um, I've actually moved to Portland, Oregon in the last year. Or so if you're looking for me in California, that's not where I am. But uh, I'd encourage you if you have a moment to visit the website. I've been blogging now for almost 20 years. So there's a couple of hundred potentially useful things out there. They're all free for you. So help yourself. Go for it. Um, okay, so let me give this back to Ian and then and figure out when our Q and A is. That's thank you very much indeed. Rich. That was great. Really enjoyed that. Um, thank you very much. Um, we'll get to the Q and A's in just a second. Uh, before we get there, I'll just do a ten second recap on how we might be able to help you, you and your organisation. Uh, we offer live online public courses, um, engaging and energising experience that allows you to learn best practice and get certified. We run private online training for your product team that can customize and deliver whenever you want, offer practical recommendations in our reviews, and don't forget these free webinars. Um, I'm just going to start with so one question from Andrew here. Uh, what's the view on software products uh, when the market is specialized and small, so less than 100 sales a year, where competitors are also low cost, but you need the software to support the hardware sale? Um, Rich, uh, yeah. any thoughts on that one? Sure, and I think there's two or three things packed in there, so I'll I'll take a few tries. First of all, if you're if you're giving away the software to sell the hardware, you're in the hardware business, and the software is a cost item um, rather than a profit item. Generally, that's what I see. Um, I don't usually expect customers to be excited about paying separately for software and hardware, uh, so you have to decide where the money is. Um, the danger here that I've seen in a lot of places is generally the cost of hardware declines over time. So if you're tying your value to the hardware, you're gonna have to sell more units every year to stay even. Um, if you can somehow give away the hardware and sell the software, notice you can collect the same money, right? But most of the, the hybrid stuff I've seen outside of IoT, um, the hardware becomes the giveaway and the software becomes the value product. And that lets you prop up value over time because the hardware has already declined. But in a world where everything gets cheaper in, in physics, uh, I think it's really hard to be giving away software to maintain hardware. You might think hard about shifting your model. Um, that may not be an option. Um, okay, I'm gonna pick a couple more here because I saw a few I wanted to take, if that's all right. Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, one from Robin that says, how do you get leadership in a company outside of sales to understand the conflict that I've just described? Um, first of all, this is a political question, but I'll answer it as, as written. So I, I generally want to look back in history here. Um, we're all going to argue about the next deal that comes in. 